Uh, we're very pleased to have the Honourable uh, Pini Henare with us. Minister Henare holds several ministerial portfolios, including that of Associate Minister of Health for Māori Health, Whānau Ora, and we very warmly welcome him. The Minister has kindly set aside an hour for us to hear from him and to answer our questions. And so without delay, I will be quiet and give the floor to Minister Henare. Thank you. Tēnā koutou katoa, e oku rangatira huritai a whio ki te motu whānui e mihi atu ana ki a koutou. Uh, koutou katoa e hono mai nei ki runga a ipurangi, a tātou katoa ki roto i te ruma nei tēnā koutou. Greetings and good morning everybody. They say you can't beat Wellington on a good day, although you won't know that because we're online. It's a beautiful day here in Wellington and you can clearly see that I'm not Andrew Little. So if you've got any hard questions, please make sure to send them through to him. But thank you very much for this opportunity to join you here today. It's a pleasure to be here on the 33rd uh, Annual ASMS Conference. Can I begin by acknowledging ASMS and in particular the Executive Director Sarah Dalton, uh, President uh, Dr Julian Viaz, and the wider ASMS National Executive. I appreciate your work as an essential voice in the health system and enjoy these opportunities uh, to connect with you. Can I also acknowledge the association's members? It seems like a very long time that my colleague, uh, Andrew Little, Minister of Health, spoke at your Creating Solutions event in July, just a few short weeks before we faced our biggest and still ongoing COVID outbreak. The Minister and I again extend our appreciation for your mahi over a very challenging few months and as we look towards the future. While the media's attention has been on daily case numbers and alert levels, work has continued at pace to progress our health reform agenda. We've hit several key marker points. The new public health agency has been established within the Ministry of Health, and interim versions of Health New Zealand and the Māori Health Authority are underway as departmental agencies within the Ministry. Boards have been appointed, and Acting Chief Executives Martin Hefford uh, for Health New Zealand and Chad Paraune for the Māori Health Authority are ensuring momentum is maintained until permanent CEs are in place. They are both currently leading key work streams in the transition unit that will, in time, transfer to the new entities. We've announced the new health system indicators that will provide a new, fit-for-purpose accountability framework that reflect the real priorities of the health system. What's just as important in that framework is our accountability structures towards the people we serve, or as they say, where the rubber meets the road. We've announced, uh, uh, significantly sorry, we also introduced the legislation to enable these changes. The Pi Order Healthy Futures Bill at the end of October. From here, the bill will go through the select committee process before its final reading and royal assent. Adjacently, we also started a major transformation of the disability system with a new Ministry of Dis for Disabled People. We, are, we have also supported infrastructure projects, expanded screening programs, funded more health research, agreed pay settlements with DHB nurses, and continued progress on other negotiations. But there is so much more that we still need to do. As you are all aware, we are going to see an increase in presentations of COVID-19 at our hospitals and within our communities across the country. Significant work has been undertaken to prepare for a surge response. I'm confident in this planning and our ability to manage a coordinated response to minimize risk and allocate resources to the right place at the right time. We've already seen some of this in action, such as the workforce mobilization and the support to public health response in Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. By taking a centralised approach, we can ensure all DHBs maintain appropriate cover whilst matching capacity to need. Some of you here, in fact, may have been part of this programme for which I offer my thanks. This is what I expect to see more of in a reformed system, collaboration and cohesion to make the best use of our people and resources. I've recently been six weeks travelling around the country 
connecting with our communities to see how we can continue to support vaccination rates. I have been encouraged by the kind of collaboration that I've witnessed, something that I haven't witnessed in my time as an Associate Health Minister, and long may that continue. Looking to the future, we're focused on managing COVID-19 in a sustainable way in our community. This work is being led by the Health System Preparedness Programme within the Ministry of Health. The DHB Chief Operating Officer Group is developing new living with COVID-19 in the community frameworks from the regional resilience plans to replace current response frameworks. This ties to the future community narrative, transitioning from quarantine management of COVID-19 to managing COVID-19 in the community. Work is also underway to develop COVID-19 hospital and community health pathways to integrate across primary and secondary care. Plans are being developed for those patients not enrolled with a general practice. As we know that for those not enrolled or regularly engaged with general practice or primary care services, we need to take a different approach to address inequities. This has had a spotlight shone on it as we've dealt with this most recent Delta outbreak, where the transmission and indeed the number of cases recognised have been from those who aren't engaged in our health sector uh, and it's important we continue to make sure that whatever we do is an equitable system that addresses their needs as well. The model allows for this, as clinical services can be drawn upon from the different providers, including Māori and Pacifica healthcare providers. This needs to have the understanding that some people will need more support and wraparound services than others. As I've been around the country, I've seen different models that work for different communities, I'm always reminded of my first visit to a place called Wairoa, and I apologise if anyone from Wairoa is on this particular conference. Uh, when I met with Wairoa, the Mayor said, Welcome, Minister, and don't tell us what to do. <laughs> that is a classic example of a community who knows what they need and knows how to achieve it. Our job is simply to support it. Health professionals occupy intimate spaces in people's lives. To deliver health services effectively, health practitioners must be culturally competent. It is vital that the work of health professionals is aligned with the full health aspirations for Māori as outlined in Te Tiriti o Waitangi. However, there is considerable variation in the quality of competency documents. According to health researcher Heather Kame, the majority of responsibility, our responsible authorities are not upholding the principles of Te Tiriti o Waitangi based on her critical Te Tiriti analysis model. The Ministry continues to work across the sector to improve the number of professionals meeting standards of cultural competency and safety. ASMS have been great supporters of and advocates for the development of a culturally competent workforce. Supporting the cultural safety statement issued by the Medical Council and Te Ohurata o Aotearoa in 2019. I encourage each of us to challenge what it means to be culturally competent and consider what else we can do as individuals to build our knowledge, recognise our biases and provide equitable health services to our communities. Of course, one of the biggest challenges facing all of us at this particular point in time is workforce. We need a sustainable workforce. This is a complex space with a multitude of issues that need addressing and our plan with us all in the health sector is to address them. We've set up the Futures Group, which has representation from ASMS, DHBs and the Transition Unit to come up with a program of action to address workforce issues. We will see tangible results from this group, including a set of evidence-based proposals that will be put to DHBs and subsequently Health New Zealand to drive our investment into the future. Preliminary, find, pre, pre, preliminary findings from the Futures Group are expected to be discussed as early as next month. Progress is also being made in the bargaining space, and I encourage the parties to continue to engage and work together constructively to reach agreement as soon as possible. A key goal of these negotiations is to address workforce issues as much as possible within the current fiscal context. Health workers require extensive training, and in reality, we need to build a medium to long-term view of increasing trainees. 
We can't just continue to squeeze the people we currently have. COVID and border restrictions caused major disruption and understandable frustration to the incoming supply of internationally trained health workers. These people are and will continue to be critical to our health system, particularly our specialist workforce. I expect to see changes in our border settings in the very near future. But the recent changes to the MIQ requirements and capacity with an additional 300 spaces, 300 spaces per month for critical health workers will help facilitate supply. Finally, from me, we're now only seven months away from a reformed health system. We have made significant progress to date and the pressure is on to keep up the momentum. I'm confident that we are on track and moving in the right direction. These changes will make a difference to you as critical healthcare workers, to patients and the users of the health system, and to the overall well-being and equity of our country. We have a lot of work to do, whilst balancing the challenging, uh, while balancing the challenges uh, that continue to come our way. I'm always a great fan and believer uh, of the words of my grandfather, the late Sir James Henari. We've come too far not to go further, and we've done too much not to do more. On behalf of myself, my colleague, the Honourable Andrew Little, and my colleagues in Cabinet, can I, each, can I say to each and every one of you, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, thank you very much. I look forward to questions. Kia ora, Minister. Thank you for that uh, address, and thank you for stepping up for uh, Andrew Little. I believe he's been sent to Auckland. Correct. Yeah. Um, so it's great to have you here, and of course, um, the work that the Māori Health Authority is going to pick up is of huge interest to us and our members, and if you want to make any remarks specific to how you envisage that will go, we'd be really happy to hear them. But in the first place, um, we have a question that's come through from our executive member, Katie Benn, who is an anaesthetist uh, based in Nelson. She asks, what commitment are you, prepare, are you making to centralised workforce planning and support to ensure SMO wellbeing, uh, appropriate training and recruitment pathways, succession planning and adequate staffing across our senior medical workforce? Yeah, that's a really good question, Katie, and I hope the weather's treating you well down in Nelson. Um, the commitment is 100% with respect to a centralised drive and plan that will make sure that we can achieve what we're trying to with respect to our workforce. Uh, if you'll indulge me and I'll tell you uh, a story. Uh, when I was 12 years old, um, my marae, my village in the far north, got 50 of us together of the same age and said, right, you will be a nurse, you will be a doctor, you will be a teacher. Uh, they said I'd be an all black, but I ended up a politician. The point of that is, what we need to do in this space is deliberate. We must be deliberate, deliberate about the way we recruit, the way we continue to support, and continue to support the personal development of our people as they come into the workforce. I use an example for, uh, with respect to the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. What we know is we have trained and qualified vaccinators, and many of our health workforce are doing the heavy lifting on this. But what we've also had is an increase of those who are what we call unregulated uh, kayapina, where they're supporting vaccination processes. What's been important as I've gone around the country is each of these people have expressed an interest in continuing in health. What we keep coming up against is system barriers that stop them from training, stop them from seeing a career pathway here, and we must tear those down, but it can only be done at least in my opinion, centrally. Once that plan is put in place, then of course we've got to look towards what does that mean regionally. As I used my story about Waidua, a true story by the way, um, we need to be able to support those local needs. Another part of, key part of your question, Katie, is succession. We in New Zealand are the worst at succession planning. We talk a big game, and you know, in particular in Māori, you hear these expressions like uh, ka pū te ruha, ka hao te rangatahi, the old net is cast aside and the new net goes fishing. But what we don't do is allow succession planning and just as importantly, continue to support them all the way to the realization um, uh, of their particular career aspiration. So we want to get better at that. But what I'm going to say though, and to finalize my answer to you is yes, 
we are committed to a central drive, but uh, it's going to take time. Uh, and in order for us to make sure that it's achieved, I'll come back to the point about being deliberate. We must be very deliberate about the way that we do this, and it must be sector-wide but centrally driven. Thank you, Minister. Um, and we certainly have lots more to talk to you about on that topic. Great. Um, the next question is from our President, Julian Vias. Thank you. Um, that's for you if you want it. Excellent. Um, so going back to your comment about your visit to uh, Wairoa um, and the need to engage with, uh, should we say, people on the ground, people who understand the environment locally, what is your commitment to ensuring formal and regular engagement with health unions, both at a ministerial level and with Health New Zealand Māori Health Authority senior management. There's an old Māori saying that says, kanohi kitea o kanohi kite kanohi. That is hugely important, and while I appreciate um, well, it's somewhat of a contradiction as I speak to you online, but my commitment to you is, and across the country, is let's do this. Let's come face to face as COVID uh, restrictions allow us to meet face to face. One of the key parts about me going around uh, the country over the past six months to drive up vaccination rates was to see it for myself, to talk to the people myself, to be able to make sure I've got a feel for what's going on and not just a, a quality report that lands on my desk here in Wellington. So uh, we're really committed to making sure that the engagement is ongoing because the key part to that in, and engagement and good engagement and proper engagement is how do you close the loops off? simply meeting and saying hello for half an hour or an hour in Wairoa or Rotorua or wherever that might be just simply isn't good enough. We must continue to hold each other to account. I talked about accountability frameworks in our health reform, and my expectation is that we'll continue to do that together so you have 100% commitment, certainly from me. Uh, I can't speak for my colleagues, but I will and say from them too. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I would make the comment that I think that is a critical part of the success of the uh, Health New Zealand Māori Health Authority uh, uh, changes is to keep all workforce engaged, feeling part of this. I think that's something that has sadly, uh, what you say, waned over time has been my experience. So the more we can re-energise that, the better. Yeah, I agree. And, and Zoom calls and stuff that certainly haven't helped our cause, but we've got a grand opportunity to do that uh, all over again. And I think you're right in saying all of our workforce. Um, meeting on these forums or with uh, leaders in this space is actually quite a regular thing. But uh, I'm, I'm the father of a DHB nurse in Taitukera, uh, and he tells me every morning what's happening and what I'm not doing. And, uh, but it's important that you get it through all of the levels, whether you're frontline, whether you're backroom, or whether you're leading the cause. I agree. Really good to know that you've got a nurse in the family. That, that'll keep you honest. Um, in terms, of, I would point out that you know the health um, workforce is one of the most unionised workforces in New Zealand, and um, the health unions work really collaboratively uh, across the professional groupings. Um, ASMS has a formal engagement structure with the DHBs, and we expect that equally there will be formal engagement structures um, with Health NZ and the Māori Health Authority. And of course, we'll be talking with those um, newly appointed interim CEs about that, but it's, it's important that we have that support from the highest level, and that's you, Minister. Um, the third question comes from Andrew Robinson, who is an anaesthetist uh, from Rotorua in Lakes DHB. Um, it's, a, it's a doozy, and it's one that is very dear to all of our members' hearts at the moment, so buckle up. Um, Have another drink. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything stronger? <laughs> Not till afternoon, Minister, I'm afraid. Um, public sector pay restraint is causing mayhem in the health workforce, um, which is facing serious and ongoing staffing shortages, as you've acknowledged. Um, these concerns apply to doctors, nurses and allied health workers. Please comment on the justification for the Labour government adopting and maintaining this policy, which is fettering our own mecha bargaining process and causing considerable anger and resentment across the health workforce and our membership, with the risk of many health workers moving overseas where salaries, um, particularly in Australia, mm. are very much higher. Yeah, look, we've, um, I'll acknowledge that there's been a challenge for wage growth across multiple sectors, and health is one of them, education another. Uh, I can speak with another portfolio um, as the Defence Minister. It's the same with our Defence Force personnel. 
who haven't had uh, an increase, I think if the last time I checked, was in about 12 years. And if we consider where, what they've done over that time and where they've been, uh, we do have significant challenges there. Look, we continue to work with um, the Minister of Finance in particular here to make sure that what we do uh, is fiscally responsible, but also um, in the past two years is cognizant of the challenge of COVID-19 and how we continue to invest to make sure that we can bounce back and recover from what's happened with respect to the pandemic. Um, I know there are challenges here. I know that Minister Little in particular, with his background, is really keen to drive up uh, wages and the earnings of our health workforce. I support him in that. Um, in fact, I can tell you, as recent as uh, a cabinet meeting not too long ago, he continues to not only update us, but tell us why we need to do this, and I agree with him wholeheartedly about why we need to for retention, for security, and to make sure that if we're, deliver if we're deliberate about our workforce strategy moving forward, we can't be ignorant to the fact that actually pay is a big part of that. I talked about my son, who's a nurse. Um, he's, uh, I think it's because he loves me, he chooses to stay home. Uh, but actually, he's had very good offers from offshore. But he chooses to stay here uh, amongst his family, of which we're grateful. But we can't just rely on that kind of you know, sentiment to keep our good kaimahi and our good workers here across all of those fields. We will um, never, ever resolve from, as a government, is how do we lift our bottom workers first and, and how do we do that properly? And, and I'll take, for example, uh, the recent um, uh, offer, um, sorry, the work that's been, being done currently with the New Zealand Defence Force. Uh, there have been significant or increases, at least marginal increases, for middle to upper rank. But our junior officers who come in who come in with trades and qualifications could quite easily earn twice as much by starting uh, outside of the Defence Force. Uh, whatever we do must lift the bottom uh, in the first instance as we look towards uh, making sure that we can continue to retain and service our workforce into the future. So you've got a commitment from us to continue to push on that. Minister Little's keen to do that. I'm keen to support him to do that. And I think with Health New Zealand and a Māori Health Authority, to your point, um, we've got a chance now to drive that centrally. At the moment, I appreciate DHBs drive a number of that in their spaces, uh, but we've got an opportunity now to drive it centrally, and I think we'll get a better outcome from it. Thanks, Minister. Um, I note your comments about the need to lift the floor. Mm. I guess our observation, given that our members are at the other yeah. end of the pay spectrum, that pushing down on the ceiling doesn't actually achieve a lift to the floor. And I, and I also want to comment, you know, what is the value of our public service? And if the Public Service Commission's aspiration to be an exemplary employer is genuine and including health and education and perhaps defence in those core yeah. public services, it's got to be more than words. And um, while I understand it is a different issue for senior medical officers, compared with very low-wage work, workers. Mm. Um, you know, CPI, as you know, is travelling yep. at a good clip currently, yep. and we do need to be aware of that. And there's only so many thank yous that, that will resonate for our members who are very much at the front end yeah. of, of COVID. So um, I, I just wanted to make those, you, those points because they are extremely important. I also would briefly just mention that, of course, the CTU to which we affiliate has now endorsed... Um, that the minimum wage should be not less than the living wage. And so just to make that point, on behalf of our health colleagues who do earn the least, um, yeah. we would hope, and, and we do acknowledge that Health NZ and the Māori Health Authority will be living wage employers, okay. and we welcome that. Thank you. Um, so we've got another question from Julian Fuller, who is another anaesthetist, actually, uh, okay. at Waitemata. Um, Julian asks... Um, sorry, it's quite a long question that Julian has put to us. Um, ASMS has produced several publications advocating for government interventions focused on the social and commercial determinants of health and outlining mechanisms by which we can achieve a more equitable health system, both in terms of access to care and outcomes. Um, what commitments will your government make to supporting these, including, but not limited to, things such as sugar taxes, 
improved provision of social housing, matching the minimum wage to the living wage, providing free access to adult primary health care, including dental care. Mm. Yeah, you raise a number of issues there, and I want to bring it back to uh, what I've always believed in uh, with respect to the Māori Health Authority. If we build an ivory tower in Wellington, we've failed with respect to a Māori Health Authority. And the reason I say that is because if we do simply build another silo here, we will have also failed. Uh, I'm also the Associate Housing Minister, uh, and what we know that if you have good housing, you generally have good health outcomes. What we also know, though, is if you build new homes and put an unhealthy family in a new home, it's still an unhealthy family. So if we build this silo in the Māori Health Authority or in Health New Zealand moving forward, then we will have failed. I always use the term with my other portfolio hat on as Minister for Whānau Ora, that family well-being, yes, health is one key component to that, but we must continue to look at other opportunities such as education, housing and employment to lift equitable outcomes for families across this country. So we're committed to that, and that's what we're, what I'm fortunate to have three portfolios that mix quite well together in housing, health and as final order minister to make sure that we can continue to drive that. While I appreciate there are strong sentiments in our communities for this, I will acknowledge, however, that turning the systems, the public service systems and the government systems to be able to pivot towards this is easier said than done, which is why the health reform work is important for us to do. Um, for example, uh, having been a former uh, MSD uh, employee, what we know is it's a behemoth of an agency, and as we look to care in our communities, they do well for approximately 68 to 75 percent of our population. But the ones who we're trying to catch for equitable outcomes, it's marginal. So we need to try and link up a bit better. The Public Service Act uh, that was put through, was it 18 months ago, I think it was, is the foundation to see the kind of cross-sector engagement with respect to the public service to be able to match what's already happening in the community, because I believe it's already happening. Um, for example, I'll come back to my son again. He's going to love me for this. Um, but, you know, he's not just a nurse. He's a counsellor. He helps and he talks to the, his, his patients and his people uh, about anything and everything. His job doesn't start at nine and finish at five. It starts before then and finishes well after. And it goes into the weekends. So how does the system pivot itself to support those kinds of outcomes? So that's what we're committed to. That's why I hold the portfolios that I do, is to bring a heck of a lot of this together. And I said it in my opening comments about COVID has given us a grand opportunity to be able to do this and do more of it. Uh, so it's happening locally. Centrally has to get in behind that better uh, as we look towards the future, and I'm committed to that. I do note in the question, though, that you mentioned uh, things like a sugar tax, amongst other things. Uh, we've already ruled out a sugar tax. And I can say, too, as one of my delegations is diabetes, uh, as an associate health minister, I've met recently, for example, with the kidney health um, sector. And their pushes for transplants and a strong system that will allow that. And, and I agree, it does need revamping, it needs strength, it needs resource. But ultimately, I'm committed to the front-end investment, which sees our people not needing a transplant. Uh, we all know the story, ambulance at the bottom of a cliff. We need to be front-loading our health system to make sure that our tamariki and our mokopuna uh, eat well, live well, so that we don't need to continue to invest in things like kidney transplants or ongoing dialysis, which is... Yes, it prolongs life, but it's about quality of life. So we want to make sure that we can do that. Anyway, look, that's my initial answer, but I do respect that this is complex. As we look towards individuals' lives, they're not the same. So for those who uh, have housing, they might have other issues, and we need to make sure that we can do that. From a Māori perspective, just finally, I can, I can say the largest tribe in this country isn't Ngāpuhi, which is my tribe. It's the Māori middle class. And so as you see the Māori middle class growing, what that actually means for us is we've got to have a service that not only continues to serve them, but actually looks towards the margins on the edge 
which is actually going to be harder than people think. Our next question is from Natalie De Vries, our National Secretary. Ko Natalie De Vries aho, ko o he takuta arota mariki, i te hoi pera o te papa i oia. Yes, so my question is about the gender pay gap. Um, female specialists uh, are paid 12.5% less per hour than their male colleagues. Um, so what do you or the ministry uh, plan to do about the persistence of the gender pay gap in medicine, uh, other than acknowledging mm. that there is an issue? Mm. And what specific initiatives are there to address this issue? Um, I was going to say I acknowledge it, but you've just <laughs> said we've all done that. <laughs> and it's been happening for a while. We've been acknowledging yes. it. Um, but it is a particular challenge. And what I do know is that... Um, Progress is being made across four pay equity claims that represent female dominant workforces, uh, including nursing, midwif midwifery, sorry, administration, and clerical and allied health workers. Now, um, I know that we've got a long way to go. That work, I understand, is progressing quite well. But if I look towards, for example, um, the Wahine Māori claim that's been put in front of the Waitangi Tribunal uh, that addresses... Um, uh, gender inequalities, um, it becomes even more stark that pay is just one part of that. There are so much across the space that we need to be doing around access, around choice, and we can't just put it down to pay to allow us or allow wahine to be able to say they've now got access and choice. We need to do this across the entire sector, which is going to be, I think, a little bit more challenging than, uh, than I can comprehend, to be honest with you. But uh, that work will continue those across those four particular streams, but look, you know, I know we've got more to do, and that's just the honest truth. Uh, I know it was said in jest in a meeting I was in recently that, by crikey, um, women are expensive, but actually, and while everyone might have had a little laugh, the fact uh, is that this has been long overdue, and we just need to invest. That's where it is. We need to invest, and we're, I'm happy to progress that. I'm happy to support, I know, Minister Little, who's keen on the same kaupapa, uh, to make sure that uh, our Minister of Finance gets that and gets it quite clearly. Minister, the next question is from Andrew Ewans. He's an ED uh, specialist, also at Waitamata District Health Board. He asks, uh, currently DHBs routinely overspend against their budgets. Now, assuming this is not due to poor financial management, this suggests ongoing underfunding of health, and that's certainly ACMS's analysis. How do you anticipate that the successes to DHBs will be able to cover the added costs arising from addressing unmet need? Hmm. Yeah, that's a tricky question. Some DHBs do a very good job and others uh, not so. What I've seen as I've gone around the country is there are inconsistencies across them all. Lots of good things, uh, lots of not so good things that continue to uh, at least from my point of view, um, reiterate why we need to do this health reform work. I'm a believer that there is over $20 billion in the health sector already, and I think that we could actually, as we look to trim the not-so-good stuff, we can continue to reinvest that. But I made it quite clear as we set out on the health reform work, and so too did the Minister of Finance in his budget speech in May last uh, earlier this year. He was quite clear when he said the um, money that was secured for Health New Zealand and the Māori Health Authority, he acknowledged was just a start. It's going to take more investment. It's going to take uh, targeted and deliberate investment. But what we can't do is throw away the good stuff in the hope that we can wipe the, sl wipe the slate clean and start again. I've made it clear, in particular to Māori communities, who keep saying... The inequity looks like about $5.5 billion. Now, there have been some very good reports that show, OK, there, needs, there has been a lack of investment in these areas, and we will need to do more. But actually, um, I don't think that's necessarily new money. I think that's money that's already in the system. Uh, where we know new money is particularly required is in our lagging capital infrastructure. And I think we'll all acknowledge that. Uh, sorry. 
Well, no, there's no, there's no um, argument from me on the, on the problems with infrastructure, but we would argue that there is significant underfunding, particularly in terms of staffing. And um, so we think there are multiple burdens, and there's probably a number of yes and equations in terms of mm. investment, both front end and at the acute hospitals end for yeah. some time to come. Look, um, to speaking of the really pointy end of healthcare, um, Andrew Robinson asks, a recent audit of ICU beds in New Zealand showed a total of 176 fully funded and staffed beds nationwide. Why then did the government announce to the public that we can run 500 critical care beds when we have difficulty providing adequate cover for the 176? Uh, that's because what we've done with that particular view is take into account our primary healthcare sector. Uh, as we've gone around the country to look towards clinics outside of hospitals, so not just counting hospitals, uh, but we're confident that as we look across the entire primary healthcare sector, there is more capacity there. Uh, but you will have seen recent announcements that, uh, from the Minister of Health uh, and the government around the way we care in community. Now, what sadly is happening from my perspective is everyone's looking at the case numbers when what we should actually be looking at is the hospitalisation rate. Uh, and why I say that is because we're confident we can continue to support those as a high vaccination rate increases around the country, we can support those people to recover in home. And I've seen it for myself in my own electorate in Tamaki Makoto, but of course in other places as I've been around the country. That's why we're confident that there is enough capacity there but we'll continue to monitor that to make sure that we can continue to meet that as we move into uh, the new protection framework uh, Friday next week. Um, come back to the comment around the, uh, the, the uh, perception there may be money to be, uh, should we say, recouped within the current system to help with the future planning. And just to really make a couple of points. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if, I'm not a health economist, I'm not involved with strategy around health spending, but if there are uh, benefits to be gained, I think what is vital and what is perhaps disappointing hasn't happened thus far is to, that there is a mechanism to share the best practices for um, spending health dollars. Uh, if we're still in a situation, as you say, that we have some health, uh, you know, DHBs that are performing well in some aspects and other DHBs performing well in other aspects, um, from my point of view, I'm, you know, from a clinical perspective, that will be shared within a network. People will be, you know, going for all the good things. That doesn't seem to happen. What but, would what would that mechanism look like? Just out of curiosity. Um, I don't know because I haven't given it thought beyond mm. responding okay. to your question. So yeah, I'll, no, I'll be honest. Right. I don't have a vision for it. I can give it some thought. But again, I'd be thinking of it from a yeah. clinician perspective. I'm not a health economist. But the other thing I would like to stress is that actually. Uh, and this goes back to the staffing issues and things is, and, and your comments about your son, so much work that is done by clinical staff, not just dentists and doctors, but other people, mm. is done with goodwill. Mm. It's done with plugging the gaps and, f you know, see a need, fill, fill a need. But what that also means and what concerns me is that the visibility, the transparency of what is done with goodwill is not there for people like yourself who are actually trying to make the system work. I think to get into detail, you know, uh, uh, DHBs do not, as I understand it, have a mechanism of knowing how much extra work yeah. their clinical staff do. Yeah, that's right. And if they don't know that, they can't even begin to uh, understand the, the nature of the shortfall. People's professional commitment means that they will go more than the extra mile for their patients. Because there's a human person at the end of this. That's right. It's not just a number that's and right. an equation. Or a nine to five but, yeah. kind of equation. But, I'll be honest, people get fatigued. Yeah. We know that there are high rates of burnout amongst medical staff and other health sector groups. And so, uh, with all respect, I would like to sound a strong, strong note of caution that relying on uh, the goodwill, relying on the, uh, the humanitarian altruism of all you know, healthcare staff uh, cannot be you know, seen as, a, uh, as an assured way of, of meeting these needs. Point made. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question from John Chambers, who's an ED uh, specialist at Dunedin. Uh, what about regional district governance and health? Will there still be local hospital boards under the new arrangements? Uh, what we've made clear is that locality planning and regions are important. So I talked earlier about accountability frameworks. Legislation and the work that's being done in policy can't just be about how 
the uh, accountability frameworks look up or into the centre towards central government. They must be where families are, where communities are. And I'll take the Iwi Māori Partnership Boards, for example. If you look into the legislation, um, the Māori Health Authority, I think, is clause 18 or 19. But the legislation establishes Iwi Māori Partnership Boards to allow for strong local influence, strong local health commissioning, and strong local leadership on health. Now, that's really important because, uh, for example, and I'll use, come back to the Wairua example, uh, where I come from in Te Tai Tukero in Auckland, it looks very different to health in Auckland. Mm -hmm. And it looks different again in Te Tai Rāwhiti. Uh, there will be similar traits or facets across all of them, but there still must be strong local leadership. And that's why I think the health reform work does that well. The Iwi Māori Partnership Boards for the Māori Health Authority, plus the localised planning and localised leadership that's required. We made it clear when we made the decision to do away with DHBs that quite a large chunk of that workforce and leadership will still be required into the health system moving forward. And we want to make sure that we just don't lose all of this expertise or lose this great work or lose this great leadership. So where we facilitate them is through the localised planning and the regions that have been established through the legislation and for the part of the Māori Health Authority, the Iwi Māori Partnership Board. Quite a specific COVID question for you now from Anthony Spencer, who asks, could you tell us how many extra nurses have been employed to staff beds for the expected extra patients coming to hospital with COVID? So this is not the community care patients. We have seen this unfold worldwide, but with two years to prepare, um, Anthony can't see that we've managed to employ any extra nurses to staff those beds. Yeah, sorry, uh, Anthony, I don't have the exact number uh, to your question. Um, I'll come back to uh, the statement I made earlier. I am confident as I've been around, I've visited uh, every DHB in this country over the past uh, three months to look towards what they're doing with respect to planning for care for COVID uh, in the institutions and not just in community. Um, and I'm confident we, uh, noting though, that we do have a fatigued workforce, we do. Uh, I'll acknowledge that big time. Um, but I am confident we've got the kind of expertise, skill and staff to continue to manage those uh, around the country. Um, but I'll be, I'll, I'll be able to come back to you on a definite number um, by the end of the day, if that's all right. I can ask for that number and send it through to you and hope we can answer his question. That'd be great, thank you. Um, Siobhan Cross, uh, who is um, uh, one of our um, branch officers um, in Canterbury, says many hospital staff feel unhappy with the lack of agency they have in managing the workload they have and trying to work for the patient population they serve. Um, they feel they are not given the opportunity to be involved in decision making. How will this be managed when there are four large regions in place under Health NZ? This comes back to the localised planning that I was talking about and the hope is that as we uh, reform in this space that the accountability framework that's established between uh, our service and our community will, should allow us the kind of leadership across those layers to make sure that the likes of um, Siobhan and the team uh, can have a say and that their say is important. Uh, we've been quite clear from the start that top heavy uh, um, or ivory tower was the term I used for the Māori Health Authority, it actually isn't where the leadership sits. The Māori Health Authority, for example, yes, can influence uh, national policy, yes, can influence national health plans, etc. But what it can't do is actually drive leadership and outcomes in Kaitaia, Whangarei, Whakatane, Gisborne, and right around the country. So this legislation must enable that strong leadership in the region. Uh, and um, look, I can say that I'll continue to make sure and look to see that that is happening because, funnily enough, my son says the same thing. It, it, the clinical, clinically led decision making is hugely important across our system okay. and it is what is occurring currently, we feel, is despite the current system, not thanks to the current system. Um, 
we know the importance of non-clinical you know, operations mm. managers, service managers and leaders in hospitals, but they need to be working in partnership with and in service of the clinical staff whose business it, is, business it is to lead health. But sadly, that is often the exception rather than the rule. We have a number of DHBs currently where there is no confidence mm. in either the leadership or the board. Um, if it wasn't this close to a new health system, I think those dissatisfactions, some of which are playing out quite publicly, um, and, and um, you know, there's a strong basis for that dissatisfaction, they would be playing out in very different ways because of the you know, coming change to Health NZ, they are playing out slightly differently, but it is, it is a real concern. And of course our yeah. members train for many, many years yeah. and are tasked with huge medico-legal responsibility in the roles they carry out. And it's incredibly frustrating for them to be stymied uh, in their, in their uh, quest to give best care for patients. And it's yeah. not just a resourcing issue. Sometimes it is um, not being heard, not being yeah. listened to, not, not being given the opportunity yeah. to speak. You know, it was interesting, four years ago when I became, first became a minister, we did a quick assessment. 68% of the senior management in courts systems around this country uh, came from telecom predominantly or the private sector. Uh, and that's all huge dissatisfaction with those who are actually doing the mahi in the court. So I take your point. I understand completely. Uh, and the hope is that we can foster that leadership and making sure that your voice is leading our conversations around health. I think part of that too is sufficient staffing because, of course, the clinical, non-clinical balance in terms of a working week mm. for a specialist mm. doctor or dentist is really out of whack at the moment. So we have a system that espouses specialist-led care, but actually in many, many services, Doesn't it's it. specialist-provided care. Yeah. So that means specialists are effectively trying to do work as junior doctors mm. as well as their specialist role and fill in gaps in the teams. Um, Alison Stern, who's a psychiatrist at Waikato, says mental health inpatient units are constantly overcrowded. Some patients have to sleep on a mattress on the floor in rooms other than bedrooms for example, interview rooms. She is not aware of any other medical specialty where these patient conditions will be accepted. Uh, how can this be resolved? Uh, the number one way we can do that is simply investment in infrastructure. Now, um, I, I, in my time as an Associate Health Minister, uh, Alison, have been part of opening three new facilities, but they just can't happen fast enough. We are playing a catch-up game here, which. Uh, I'll acknowledge isn't ideal, uh, and it doesn't suit, of course, our um, patients and our whānau who look towards these services. I'm not going to hide away from the challenge that we have here. The number one way to solve that is simply investment in infrastructure. One of the interesting assessments that I saw across uh, a number of DHBs, I won't name them, but a number of DHBs uh, in, across the country were that up to 40% in some instances of their assets weren't being utilised. Now, for whatever reason, that just seems like a number too high. And when we're looking at facilities like the one you've just described, then why aren't we looking towards that unutilised asset, making sure or seeing at least if it's fit for purpose, uh, and I suspect in some cases it won't be, but where it is, why can't we pivot those to make sure we serve. But the bottom line is the only way you're going to fix that is investment in infrastructure, and I know we need more of it. Um, I have a question from another emergency physician, Tanya Wilton, who's based in the Huck Valley here. She asks, what do you think will happen with the likely increase in COVID illness burden in coming weeks, combined with the reduction in accessible healthcare options over the holiday period? That is, many primary healthcare clinics will be closed. Um, to her knowledge, there is little local or broader planning going on. Um, presumably that's based particularly in her knowledge of the, of the hut in wider Wellington region. Look, I'm satisfied as I've been around the country, Tanya, and thank you for your question, uh, that uh, we can't just rely on the health sector to do this. It became clear to us from the start that there is a role for iwi and for community leadership in this space to be able to continue to plan for and care for our whānau during the summer period and beyond. We know Auckland will open up on December 15. And the challenge we have is as 74% of Ngāpuhi, for example, live in Auckland, 
There's only one place they're going to look towards going to over summer, and that's Taitokero, uh, an area with poor health infrastructure, uh, 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 a tired workforce, etc. all the things that you're well aware of. So instead of continuing to put more stress on that system, we've been over the past eight weeks planning with iwi, community, social providers, amongst others, to see how they can pick up a large part of that slack. And we talked earlier about health can't be a silo game. It must be an overall care thing. For example, I take one of the families who I was recently engaged with, uh, who sadly um, contracted COVID. Uh, health went in, gave them great advice, put them in the house, isolated them, and then remembered that they lived an hour and a half away from a shop. So how are you going to get food to them? How are you going to get care to them? while well, other parts of our community and our sector can pick up that slack, uh, meaning that the health care, while still important, doesn't have to be the lead force in this. Uh, and I'll just finally, uh, in my answer to you, if you have a look at the Tainui website, you will find their marae protection plan, their whānau care plan, that have been all supported by DHB, local Māori health providers, local PHOs. It is a grand example of how we can do this for our whānau and do it properly. I think, you know, we are very much aware with our um, members who are mostly hospital-based mm -hmm. that uh, one of the real drivers of demand in the hospitals is that there are many parts of the country where there are not enough GPs and there are also cost barriers to yeah. GP care. So while it is great that there are places where there are there is effectively locality planning already in place, mm -hmm. What we hear on a regular basis is there are many parts of our communities, and you've referenced those in what you've said to us today, that simply aren't hooked in to those services, aren't able to access yep. them, or the GPs and primary care services that exist are simply overwhelmed. Mm. There aren't enough of them. So it's a real yes and equation in mm. terms of staffing and, and resource shortages. And I think that is certainly what's driving concerns by it from our ED um, specialists because they are the front door of our hospitals yep. and they are seeing a massive burden and a massive demand, much of which doesn't, strictly speaking, count as people in need of emergency care, but they are absolutely people in need of health care. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, so we've got... Um, there's, there's a lot of questions about COVID and about the ICU shortages, <laughs> and so I'll just make the comment from Julian Fuller. Um, he says it's time to end the reliance on the Kiwi number 8 wire attitude with continually being told to do more with less. With a stunning less than four staffed ICU beds per 100,000 people as compared to the nine of Australia or the 34 of Germany, it must be time to increase resources to meet demand. And, you know, this is a very, you know, it's a real concern and anxiety mm. across our members who will be, you know, right at the front of, of meeting this need. And I think something also that some of these issues are specific to COVID, but also what COVID has done is shine a spotlight on existing yeah. shortage That's and right. existing failure to resource and to plan. So That's I acknowledge right. that you have met, said those things yourself, but we are really looking for some very specific and tangible interventions from this government, uh, both for the facilities in which our healthcare workers are based, but also to the healthcare workers themselves who cannot continue to do more with less, and that, of course, includes remuneration. Um, and there's two questions that I'll just put together from two of our dental specialists, and you've touched on this already. One of them asks you to comment on how Health New Zealand will focus on prevention strategies, dental caries, obesity, rheumatic heart disease, particularly with regard to the social determinants of health rather than just service delivery models, and you have touched on that. And another that says, what is the government doing to address adult oral health inequity and inequality for Māori and Pacifica people now and in the health reforms? Because, you know, we know that um, there's this weird pretense in primary provision that somehow dental care is a luxury mm. or cosmetic, and it's completely privatised for adults. Mm. And that, but, but, you know, failure to look after our teeth yeah. and our oral health has massive flow and effects for our overall yeah. um, health and well-being, and it is a major concern for our, for our members who are dentists and specialist dentists in yeah. hospitals. Okay. Great. Anything you want to say about that? <laughs> I'll, bite in, I'll bite into that one. <laughs> um, look, I recall in the 90s when we had a huge growth in Māori health provider networks around the country, there were 
uh, of the 34, sorry, 33 Māori health providers at the time by the end of the 90s, uh, there were 14 of them that provided full dental services, 14. And in fact, one of the men, um, Bob McKeg actually, was one of the key drivers in that. I sadly Bob passed away, but anyway. Uh, now, so we're talking 1998, 1999. Uh, we are now in 2021, and there are only three Māori health providers providing these services now. So I acknowledge there's a huge, huge gap in uh, workforce, huge gap in workforce training, huge gap in the infrastructure that will allow them to be able to provide oral health care, um, whether it's the full dental services or simply just strong campaigning around healthy teeth, et cetera. Um, there is a huge lack and there's a huge gap there. I, I acknowledge that. And it's going to be a, a long-standing challenge on how we look to address that. Part of it, though, and I'll acknowledge it too, is funding. And I take the words of uh, uh, the late Sir Michael Cullen, who whose biggest regrets after his time in Parliament was that he didn't get free oral health care for all New Zealanders of all ages. Um, and simply his rationale, according to him, was the cost was too great. Uh, and I think that's quite poignant coming from a former finance minister, which highlights the challenge that we have there with respect to resource. Uh, the other one, the other question was about uh, care, sorry, it was about... Um, yeah, so it was, it, no, it was about, um, uh, like, uh, how do you uh, make sure that um, you can prevent oh, a heck of... the two minutes yes, in prevention yeah. as well as yeah. um, post-care, yep. Yeah, 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 that's yep. right. Uh, and I said it earlier uh, about how we need to not be an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff with respect to kidney transplants, yeah. uh, and this is where we need to front load it. We've already um, started the new work on um, nutrition across the country, as well as one of my other delegations is Active Aotearoa, which is about pushing strong, healthy, active lifestyles amongst our young people in particular to prevent these things down into the future. Ultimately, what we're talking about here, though, is flipping our current model onto its head, which is going to be difficult, and I suspect it's going to have large rub in some places, that it's going to be quite difficult as we look towards making sure we invest in those those sort of early intervention stuff. Uh, the problem, and this is a political one, it's not your problem, it's my problem, is that takes a generation to see that change. No time like the present though, and I want to yeah. push you on your comments about Michael Cullen's regrets and suggest that actually the funding um, has a really positive cost benefit to it. And yeah, there might be some initial um, upfront costs that look large, but there's no such thing as a small health budget. You know, it's always going to be a big one. I think people and, call it a black hole. And we would like, well, we don't see it as a black hole <laughs> if it's done correctly. And we would like to challenge you to take up uh, Michael Cullen's um, comments mm. and look to fund adult dental care as a priority. We all know that the cost benefit would, would be in favour of a healthier population within a generation. So we would really challenge you to champion that investment. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I think the, the benefit, sorry, Sarah, is there's obviously moral benefit. There's the fact that people deserve a high quality health system. But there are financial benefits as well. And there are data to show that for every dollar invested, That's right. I forget the exact number, but it's a yeah. dollar plus, isn't there? Several three, dollars come back, three, yeah. four dollars back. Yeah. So it's, yes, there may be upfront costs, but it's, it's, it's planting the seeds for a better country. Oh, look, I, like I, I, I'm I, sure I don't need to say that, so apologies, yeah. I'm not trying no, to... No, that's fine. Now, look, I use the example of the Māori dental services. Um, I was a teenager through the 90s. I benefited from that. The only teeth I've lost was from rugby, <laughs> you know? And, and that's because we had good care and services. And I didn't live in Auckland. I didn't live in an urban centre. I lived in a small, socially deprived town called Moirewa. But we had services, and it worked for my generation. That's been lost. So I, I, I appreciate and acknowledge, and um, I'm happy to take up your challenge. Great, that's fantastic. Um, I realise that you only have a few minutes left with us, but I have two final questions that I'd really like to put to you. Sure. Um, one is uh, from Matthew Dunn, asks, what are the plans for free at point of access primary care? Co-payments create massive inequity. The yep. disadvantaged are put off attending, which excludes them from the great success of primary care, primary prevention, 
or practices forego the co-payments, making high needs areas less attractive. Yeah, um, look, I saw that as I went around the country with COVID-19, one of the best things, well, one of the most amazing things I saw was uh, a local pharmacy wiping approximately $86,000 of unpaid uh, prescriptions to make sure that they can reconnect with their community to be able to continue to provide um, uh, medicines, but also to talk about the vaccine. So that's why I saw this particular thing. This is another one of those resourcing challenges that we have as we look towards making sure that we can eliminate barriers. And that's just one barrier. If you look at the inequities at the moment, to access, that's only one. So we've got to deal with all of these barriers, but I acknowledge that this is one of those barriers. And the short answer is, and the Minister of Finance probably isn't going to like me for this, but it does take money. It does take money, and we have weirdly set up a raft of primary care in New Zealand as, as business profit-making enterprises. Mm. Mm. And we are a little bit mystified if public health, you know, if health is a public good, and we very much believe that health care is and that this government espouses that as well, then we need to change those models for access to primary care. And that will mean that they need to be publicly and centrally funded. Um, so I think it's going to have to be the last question, which is a shame because there's a great one just come in about rural GP, rural DHBs being heavily reliant on locums. So um, I just want to leave that with you as something to ponder because okay. that is... Um, there is heavy reliance on a number of services for locums as business as usual, which again speaks to the weird ways we fund our staffing. Um, but the question is a mental health one from Yasmin Kambalosevic. Uh, mental health staff not only get burned out with their workload, but also get assaulted from patients quite frequently. This issue is overlooked, and it often is overlooked. What will New Health Authority, Health New Zealand, do to address all determinants of health and mental health including for staff mm. working in those settings? Yeah, look, um, I don't have an answer with respect to how do we prevent assaults in those spaces. Um, I, I actually don't. Um, I, of course, we'd look towards the way that, or not the way, sorry, the place in which you're caring for people. For example, I've seen the new facility um, in Auckland that has quite a large number of circuit breakers to things like assault, amongst other things, which I think are important. Um, but with respect to uh, the other, can you go to the first part of that question, sorry? Uh, our mental health staff not only get burned out with yeah. their workload, but also get assaulted, and the issue is often overlooked. So it's, it's not, we accept, I think, mm. that there will, you know, when you're caring for people with acute mental health illness, they may be violent. Mm. And I know that staff working in mental health are trained to deal with that, to de-escalate, to cope with those potentially unsafe situations, although I would note that emergency departments are singularly mm. poorly uh, set up to manage those yeah. patients when they're waiting for beds. But I think it's about the failure to put proper care to, and proper um, measures and systems in place to, ish, to look into the well-being of the staff, staff. who routinely are faced with having to work in those quite violent, mm. quite difficult settings. And as you've mentioned already, most of our hospitals don't enjoy yeah. nice infrastructure, fit for purpose, up to date infrastructure. So the physical setups are actually add to the mm. to the danger and the difficulty of dealing with unwell and violent patients. Look all I'll say to Yasmin is um, I'd be keen to hear her ideas. Now's the time to share them as we as the legislation is doing its thing. I talked about July one being uh, all systems go, Yasmin, if you want to send through those ideas on how we might make a work environment and in particular that workforce safer, but this is to everybody right across the entire health sector. I'm up for those ideas. Make sure you send them through pne.henare at govt.nz, or parliament.govt.nz. Minister, we're launching um, our latest report later today, which does focus on our psychiatrist workforce, so we will send you a copy of that as we launch it, and um, we want to really thank you for your time. So, Julian, you... Yeah, so, thank you very much for coming. I appreciate uh, you taking the time from your busy schedule. Uh, thank you for answering our questions. Um, uh, we've probably got a lot of questions. This is clearly something that, uh, that our members feel, I was going to say passionately, that's an understanding. This is our lifeblood. This is what we do. This is what we feel deeply about. And... Uh, I would ask and encourage you and your colleagues to, to 
go back to the first question, keep in touch with us. We Great. will be happy to talk at any time. We want to share. We want to make this process yeah. work for the people who need it to work. We feel that our on-the-ground clinical understanding of how all the planning actually works in real life is invaluable for this, and we don't want clinical voices to be lost at higher strategic economic levels. So please, uh, thank you for coming, and uh, I welcome you. We would like to give you these, a little bit of light reading for your next journey. Excellent. Um, I think you're aware, you've certainly re referenced yeah. that already, so, um, yep. but thank you. No, perfect. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you very much. Kia ora, and thank you to everybody. Um, I do mean it. Send through your recommendations and your suggestions. Be more than happy. Also, the questions that we couldn't address today. Kia ora. Thank you.